grace, mercy, and peace be to you, in God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ryan, can you hear me? I'm not, I'm not hearing myself on the nope. speakers. No? Good? Check? Okay, yeah. there you go. Let's try this again. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight is all about giving. No, I didn't get my calendar confused. I am not mistakenly giving you a Christmas sermon. Rather, we are gathered here tonight to remember, honor, and participate in the things that our Lord gives to us on this holy night, this beginning of the Tridium. As we recall that final evening before his arrest, spent with his closest friends celebrating the Passover together, themselves remembering when the Lord had given freedom to his people and brought Israel out of Egypt, let us observe the deliverance that our Lord once more gives to the new Israel, the church, as we mark with joy and sadness the bittersweet ending of Lent and the journey towards the final truth. The first thing he gives us tonight is an example and a command attached to it. After watching his disciples be having a somewhat cryptic warning about what is going to transpire over the next few days, Christ gives the mandate for which Monday Thursday's name, a new command that I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Yeah, it's a statement of law, but it's at least it's the kind of law that gives us the nice, warm, fuzzy, feel-good experience, the kind of law that some people might confuse with gospel, like when they share that quote often misattributed to St. Francis of C.C., where they say, preach the gospel at all times, necessary use words. As if the sum of Christianity is in the things you do, how good of a person you are, and, you know, as long as people are shown love, then Christ's ministry has been fulfilled. Like, the entire law gospel, like everything you do is the law, and the gospel is what God has done for you, which must be proclaimed. That does not become evidence by works. So yeah, works of love may open the avenue to tell others about the good news, but words are always necessary if you are to preach the gospel. But for now, I want to address how this is a new commandment. After all, Jesus has commanded love before. You know, he told the young lawyer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In the Sermon on the Mount, he taught us, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray those who persecute you. So how is a new commandment that he gives us tonight? It comes from that qualifier again, just as I have loved you, you also are to love them. It's an intensification beyond what anyone was expecting. The disciples don't even realize how intensifying this is yet. Because Jesus loves self sacrificial Even though he is God, he has lowered himself down to the lowest servant position possible by washing their feet. As Paul summarizes it to the Philippians, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. No, this is not to say that you are yourself worthless or you should think of yourself as worthless. Rather, you are to recognize that even though you are a priceless treasure of God most high, you are to consider those around you as if they are greater. Jesus is God, but he considers those disciples greater than him for the sake of showing them love in washing their feet. This is the level of self-sacrificial love that we have been called to show to the world around us. Which makes sense when you think about it. You know, if one of the classical definitions of sin is incorruptus and say, man hurting on himself, doing everything for selfish ends, only considering his own needs and ambitions, then the opposite godly way must be man looking outwards. Man seeing those in need and helping however he can. Man sacrificing his own comfort, potentially willing to give his own life for the sake of the other. It truly is a radical love that goes beyond just Forgive people even when they don't seem like they're sorry. Or restrain yourself from calling somebody that angry word you really want to call. We are called to put our selfishness aside and be ready to make sacrifices for one another. We are called to look differently than those who don't know Christ. It really is just this water down, generally be good to everyone, feeling that people ought to take Christian morality to be the next statement. By this, all people will know you are meant to buy disciples if you love one another. It would make no sense. If our generosity born from love doesn't stand out from the lives of the godless, then we're not really we are really upholding this mandate Christ gives us. As warm and fuzzy as talking about love might make us feel, we should probably read John's account of the Last Supper as convicting, with the realization that tribes might all remain selfish to one degree or another. We have all fallen short of this marker he has established for his disciples. We can't uphold this law any more than we can perfectly uphold any of the others. We are incredibly fortunate that the next thing he gives us is the gospel, made tangible through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But that is what the sacrament is, the promise of God is attached to a physical means. And here we get into tonight's gospel and epistle readings, where we hear those familiar words that on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Within the real presence, in the under the bread and wine, we receive his true body and blood. In that we receive the forgiveness of all of our sins, that forgiveness we desperately need. We receive the strength of faith to further move us towards the right worship of him. That through him we are made into good trees, so that by the new nature he has given us, we might produce good fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, those works of love that he has mandated for us to And yet, as we read Paul's verse to the Corinthians, we find a chilling warning. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. What does that mean? We're going to clarify what it is to take the Lord's body and blood in an unworthy manner to make sure we don't do that, lest we invite God's judgment upon ourselves. We are in no position where we want to be judged. The small catechism says that person is truly worthy and well prepared. Let's make these words. Give any shift for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who does not believe towards without step is unworthy and unprepared. For the words, for you, require all hearts to believe. And Luther's uh, Christian questions and their answers, found on page 329 of your hymnal, before start, those are more details on how you might prepare yourself to receive it. I would encourage you to get into the habit of reading through those questions while you wait for the usher to bring you up to the altar to prepare to receive it. And these aren't fine explanations, but we're talking abstractly about the Lord's Supper, what it means for us, and how the individual might prepare for herself. But as we're specifically looking at 1 Corinthians 11, I think there's another aspect of play we need to be aware of based on the context of the it would seem that uh, when the congregation was gathered together for worship and the sacrament, they didn't really have a dedicated sanctuary space. Christianity is still illegal in the empire, so they would gather in the one of the larger houses of one of the wealthier members. And the Lord's Supper would then be part of a bigger meal. It's kind of first century potluck with uh, communion at the end. However, as they gathered in these houses and people were sorted into the rooms where they would sit, where space was available, human nature came into play. Favoritism was practiced. So instead of being one unified congregation within the house, they were separated into their own little groups, their own little social hierarchies, uh, where you had one room where people were feasting richly and other rooms where people were going hungry. Some were even getting drunk on wine, possibly even the consecrated wine. In the end, they were approaching their worship and communion entirely as a group of individuals in their lives and sex. They did not look out for the other members of the congregation. They did not really even think of themselves as a congregation. Each looked after his own interests, at best, maybe the interests of their own little clique within the group. They were not reflecting upon their sinful nature. They were not repentant of sins they had committed. Judging from the other issues Paul brings up in this book, because so many of them were taking communion just to give them a license to indulge in their sins, treating it as a way to you know, clear out the ledger so they could just go out and fill it right back up again. The trap we often fall into with our own emphasis on grace through faith, not by works. It's what Bonnie would call cheap grace. But in doing this, they have profaned the gift of the sacrament. They have taken the Lord's name in vain. They have abused God's mercy. They have ignored those around them in order to take what each individual wanted. They did not eat a drink in order to proclaim more death and a new reality that it means for Christians. They used it to try to steal salvation from Christ while ignoring his name of sacrificial love. So severe was their sin towards the sacrament that God brought his judgment against them. Paul tells us many became sick and some even died. That's one way that we approach the sacrament matters. That's why we, as a synod, practice closed communion. Not because we think we're better than the Baptists or Wells or any of the other groups out there, but because we want to be sure that everyone comes to the rail and knows what that means, that they have examined themselves, that they are approaching the table as a community, confessing a common faith amongst those around them, not as a collection of individuals each believing whatever they want to believe. That's why I emphasize using the common cup, like I said in the opening statements, for the confession, that we are all one in this great gift that Christ gives us this night, that we are all a people standing before our Heavenly Father. So I've heard it said that you never take communion for yourself, and nobody gives himself communion. Rather, we always receive communion with outstretched hands. Confessing that gift of forgiveness is not something we could ever do or earn or retreat ourselves. It must be given to us as a free gift by Christ through the means of his church. We respect that he is truly present in the red wine. They truly are his body and blood. That is why I always bow to them and I consecrate them. We don't casually pop the host into our mouths as if it's a handful of popcorn. We elevate and enthrone our hands to show respect and worship the true presence of Christ's body that we receive, and then we reverently take and eat according to his command. That's why whatever is left after the service is taken back to the sacristy, not consume it after the service, to make sure that his command to take and eat and drink is fulfilled. That's why when you are dismissed from the table in light of what you have received from God, that your sins are forgiven, your proper response is, Amen. A word of certainty and truth, a trust that God truly has delivered unto you the great gift which he has promised. For against Paul's warning against taking communion unworthily is the sure and certain cause. That those who are truly repentant of their sins, who truly recognize that they depend entirely upon grace, God's grace and mercy, who place their hope and trust in Christ, that is that faith that we cannot become in repentance, they receive forgiveness. 
And therefore, they stand ready to be judged by God because when God looks upon them, he only sees Christ's righteousness given and shed. For he, that is the third and final thing our Lord Jesus Christ gives to us this night. And it's only him that we have to turn out of all this, where he will be arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced, and executed for our sake. For tonight, he gives himself over to the authorities so that he may give us his life. This is the self sacrificial love that he models for us. He dies, but he did. So let us humbly examine ourselves. Let us remember the full beauty of what he brings to us in the sacrament. And then let us come to the altar to receive the forgiveness which he does. Come, let us worship. Amen. Please rise as you are. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, for the revelation of your will and grace. And plant your word in us, that with good and honest heart you may keep it and bring forth the fruits of faith. We humbly implore you to rule and govern your church throughout the world. Let all of us proclaim your truth, that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, and that faith in you may be strengthened, love towards others increased, and your kingdom extended. Send forth labors into your harvest and sustain those whom you have sent, that the word of reconciliation may be proclaimed to all people and gospel preached in all the world. And help and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially to the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of Heaven, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Grant them grace to rule according to your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and to the hindrance and punishness, punishment of wickedness, that we may live quiet and peaceable lives of godliness and honesty. According to your good pleasure from the hearts of our enemies and adversaries, that they may cease their hostilities and walk with us in meekness and in peace. Comfort, O God, with your Holy Spirit, all who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity. Grant courage and steadfastness, especially to those who suffer for your sake, that they may receive and accept their afflictions and confidence that you will acknowledge them as your own. Although we have deserved your righteous wrath and punishment, yet we ask you, O most merciful Father, not to remember the sins of our youth or many transgressions, but your unspeakable goodness and mercy, defend us from all harm and danger to body and soul. Preserve us from all suffering, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from failure of harvest and from famine, from anguish of heart to despair of mercy, and from evil. In every time of trouble, show yourself a very present help, the Savior of all, especially to those who believe. Cause all the fruits of the earth to prosper that we may enjoy the new season. Give success to Christian training of the young, to all lawful occupations of the land, and air, and to all pure arts and useful knowledge, crowning them with your blessing. We see all our bodies and souls and all our towns, together with the opportunity for you. For by his blood, your son has purchased, purchased us to be your own, that we may live under him in his kingdom. These and whatsoever other things you would have of us, as ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive you cross your arms over your chest and receive a blessing instead. If you desire from the cup, put one arm across your chest as a signal to me, and I will bring it to you after the individual cups. If you are unable to make it to the right, let's just bring it to you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that for death arose, their life might also arise again, and that the servant who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we love and magnify your glory, and we're praising you in sin. Amen. 